Hello and welcome to a virtual museum tour of the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. My name is Abby Pangeli. I'm an armature and I live in the barony of Highland Ward from the Kingdom of Atlantia. So about me, I have a background in history and art history with a matches exhibition design. I work in museums in Washington, D.C. and while the um, while we were in quarantine, while my, the museum my current work had shut down, my coworker and I were doing virtual tours almost weekly of different museums all around the world. So between you know April 2020 and June uh, 2021, we've done 60 some odd. <laughs> uh, so I figured. Not to let that work go to waste and share it with the SCA. Now, in this tour, what to expect is um, we're going to talk some about the museum history. We'll do a walkthrough with Google Arts and Culture. We'll, I'll talk some about the exhibition design because that is my background. And we'll look at some highlight objects. So this is the main entrance for the parking lot. The Israel Museum was founded in 1965 and is considered Israel's national museum. It's the largest cultural institution in the state of Israel, and as you can see from this sign, um, most labels in the museum are in English, Hebrew, and Arabic. Um, in some places, it's just English and Hebrew. And it's takes it's on a 20-acre campus, so it's this massive set of grounds all throughout and the original design of the museum was by Alfred Mansfield and Dora Gad, but in 2010 there was a number of renovations that included new galleries, there was new entrances, public spaces, uh, done by James Carpenter Design Associates of New York and Efra uh, Kowalski, architect of Tel Aviv. And it was a three-year project designed to enhance the experience of the museum's collections, architecture, and surrounding landscapes. Uh, also, there was uh, renovation of the various wings. As I mentioned, um, it's a massive set of buildings and it's built into the hill. You can see where it is compared to the rest of the city, just built around it out here on the sides. And basically each building is a different wing and they also have an expansive uh, Art Garden, which was designed uh, for the original campus by the Japanese American sculptor um, Isamu Noguchi. And it, uh, in it are works uh, by Jack Lipschitz, Henry Moore, uh, Blaise Oldenburg, Pablo Picasso, Rodin, and David Smith. And then there's also site specific commissions by artists such as Magdalena Bakanowitz, uh, Mark Dion, James Terrell, and Micah Ullman. So as I said, there are a number of different wings. Each of the wings have a different focus. The, we have the uh, second temple model, which was literally a model of the, sorry, uh, of the second temple of Jerusalem, which retrieves the city as of 66 CE at the height of its glory. And um, it was like the eve of the revolt of the Jews against the Romans at which point the city spread over 450 acres. This model is about a thousand square meters. And then we also have the uh, Shrine of the Book, which is right across from it, which we'll take a closer look at, which actually houses some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the oldest biblical manuscripts in the world. And then we also, as you can see, we also have archeology span wings, Jewish art and life wings, fine arts wings, over 500,000 objects are in the museum's collection, which means that it has um, a wide representation of world material culture. The, the collections are considered encyclopedic, which has works dating from prehistory to the present day. And they, again, are built into the hill. You can basically get that to them from um, via staircases, both inside the building and outside the buildings. But um, it's a little bit of a maze, which you'll notice as we go through. Something that I really like about their exterior design is that you can see how they're using the banners 
to promote their upcoming exhibitions, and they're really making this into a more lively space. Again, you can see how they uh, advertised for their 2010 renovation. I always love to see when museums do parties and what they do about it. So you can see that they're really taking off here with using the space for public engagement and other activities. Again, this is just uh, Ramesh Kapoor sculpture. We have our big love sign, similar to what you may see in Philadelphia and across the rest of the world. And the um, artwork is just really engaging. It leads to what we call a lot of Instagrammable moments in the museum field. This is the second temple model I mentioned earlier, which we'll also take a closer look at later. It was actually moved here to the museum in 2006 in a hundred parts and put back together. And this is the outside of the Shrine of the Book building, which, as I mentioned, houses the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the first seven Sea Scrolls were discovered in Qumran in 1947, and this white dome uh, embodies, it's really evocative of the lids of the jars that the first scrolls were found in. And it's basically considered an international landmark of modern architecture architecture at this point. It was designed by American Jewish architects Armand B. Bartos and um, Frederick J. Keisler and is dedicated in a very large ceremony in 1965. Um, its location is basically next to the official institutes of the State of Israel. There's key government offices nearby. There's the Jewish National University Library. So basically it is put near all of these things and one of the um, other artworks near it, this is basically, uh, this is coming from the museum website here, it was like the contrast between the white dome and the black wall alongside it alludes to the tension evident in the scrolls between the spiritual world of the Sons of Light, as these day and desert secretarians, um, sectarians called themselves, and Sons of Darkness, the sex enemies. And then you'll see an underground corridor later, which leads into the shrine, which resembles a cave, which it's evocative of the site where the manuscripts were originally discovered. So with that, we're going to move out of my PowerPoint and into the museum website. I always love showing off museum websites because you can learn so much from them. One of the lovely things about the internet is that we can use them, uh, use it to learn about our hobby of the SCA. So this is a very basic website. Um, I just scrolled through it. Um, it didn't scroll down like you may typically see, but it just has a different panning. You can see what upcoming events. You can see well, what's going on in the museum shop. This uh, is an upcoming events page where you know you can learn more about the exhibitions that are coming in. And while I don't expect the Google Arts and Culture chapter to be updated for each of the upcoming exhibitions, you can always come back later to learn more about the exhibition, what items are featured in it, and other things. This museum is very good about putting curator talks and tours on the website, so I definitely recommend taking a look as well as on their YouTube channel. So this is their interactive map which, you know, if I click on the second temple model, it'll bring me to more information about, uh, the, mo about the model. It's a little bit of a clunky interactive. Um, as I mentioned, there's other wings. So this kind of shows the breakdown from the original large map of what's in the various wings. So, if I click on illuminating script, again, it up here you can see the different ways that you can, uh, the different focus points of these galleries. So we're in the Jewish Art and Life Wing, we're looking at the illuminating the script section. And also on this campus map, this is a non-interactive version. Um, it kind of, again, just shows you the overall view of the museum and 
how it is laid out. This is also a way to interact with the different collections where if we're in the Jewish Art and Life, this is the overall wing. Again, we can just go to, you know, the gallery map, which we were looking at before, we could read more. And it just tells you more about the wing overall and different ways you can interact with the information. So enough about that. We're going to move on to the Google Arts and Culture, which is just the comprehensive way that the museum captured uh, their images before. So a basic Google Arts and Culture page always has a little blurb about the museum. Sometimes they're longer than others. They call these online exhibits. They're truly just a bit of flipbook here where you can go through. And sometimes there's music. I'm just going to go back to the page. Uh, it shows you a highlight objects of the collection. You can organize the objects. Um, you see above where it's by material. Here you can do it by popularity. You can do it by when objects were created. You can do it by colors. And if you click on an object, you know, it brings you to a page about the object where you can zoom in and look at the fine details of the object. You can learn more about its construction or how it was made. And also it gives you more information about the object. Normally it's not as thorough as a collection website entry, just as an FYI. And, you know, even here where it's telling you when it was created, it'll show you uh, where to see it in on the collection page, as well as if I hit view and street view, it would take us to that spot in the Google Arts and Culture. But since I don't want us to get lost, I'm not going to click that right now. But feel free to explore at your convenience. So this is the beginning of our true tour here. I'm going to organize my notes. All right. So this is basically I'm working at starting at the top of the hill and I'm working our way down. This is one of the contemporary art spaces. And the object that I really want to show you, which is not period, but I think it's important to be comprehensive of the museum and show you some of the objects and gallery views, even if they aren't period to the SCH, that way you get a true understanding of this institution. So this is originally made um, in 2007, but its name is Rosés by the artist Mircea Cantor, who is a Romanian artist born in 1977. He follows the tradition of the French artist uh, Marcel Duchamp in that he uses ready-made objects. Now, this is a box of a rose window, and it was actually, he came up with the idea based on seeing a Romanian street vendor selling these star-shaped ashtrays made from soda cans in front of um, Pompidou Center in Paris. And he asked, you know, how much do they cost? And the Romanian artist replied, give me what you want and take what you want. Um, and so Cantor bought all of these different ashtrays to make into this rose window because it's also just the um, Pompidou Center in Paris is near the cathedral and it's just kind of that dichotomy of you have something big and glorious and well known and then you know it's basically trash being sold at its feet even if not directly at its feet this is about 13 feet in diameter 400 centimeters and i just always love taking a quick look at it and especially the shadows on the wall behind and again, this is just one of their entrances at the top of the hill. It's very basic. Also, just FYI, with Google Arts and Culture, some museums have these tabs you can click on on the bottom that'll take you to key objects. Some of them, some of the museums do not have that accessibility, but I 
in order to not make this class last five hours, I did pull up key views. This is another modern room that I love, which is, it's literally showing the history of chairs and interesting chairs, you know, in the 20th century, which tickles me. Again, it's interesting exhibition design because they have the chairs on the walls hanging off in weird angles. They're having a lot of spotlights for it in what's otherwise a white walls um, exhibition, which is what they call, you know, it's kind of just plain and white like that with interactives going around again we have the multilingual labels and you can just also see on the floor you know how you can how visitors can participate within the museum by donating to it get a mark on the floor sort of deal which is a great way for the lead into some sponsorship so again, not period yet, but I wanted to show you how they are cordoning off some of their objects in these areas. So oh, that's one of the issues. Sometimes they blur out objects when you're too close because we're limited by technology. And they have these little, you know, do not cross sticky lines um, on the bottom, but again, not even going all the way around on the edges of the piece just at key points so then you have objects like this chair that are just sitting out so i'm sure there's a security guard that's in here all the time being like don't touch that stay away because people will hit themselves on this that is not ada compliant with the uh <laughs> depth that you want for a cane to be able to knock into before hitting an actual object that will take shins out because that's metal and then I always love seeing how projectors are hidden or not in museums. And they did a really good job here with just sticking it in the ceiling and just having it straight on the ground. Again, I don't expect people to look up at museums. So I'm a museum lighting designer. I look up all the time and you just find the most interesting things. So here we are in, uh, in their Chinese gallery and in front of us is a display of 11 bronze bells. Uh, these are known as bianzong, which are polyphonic bells, which means that they pay, play more than one note at a time. They were made in the spring and autumn period of Chinese history, which is about 770 to 403 BCE, which is the first half of the Eastern Tao period. They range in size from 19 centimeters here on the right hand down up to 37 centimeters on the left and these chime bells were quintessential instruments used in the performance of ceremonial music they're clapperless so there's nothing in them that is going back and forth you hit them with mallets and when you see these bells in most museums they are hung this way on a horizontal rod because that's how they were traditionally hung now, zong bells are cast and they're kind of special in that they're lens shaped. So if you imagine like your eye lens, how it's not a circle or an oval, it's a little bit pointed towards the sides. Um, that's how these are shaped if you're looking at them straight down. And they have what's called a cutaway profile, meaning that there are parts of it that are thicker than others, um, which is how you end up with the multiple uh, tones and pitches coming out of the bell if you hit it at the same time. The outer surfaces of the bells feature 36 studs or bosses, which are symmetrically placed around the body in four groups of nine. And that also contributes to the fact that, you know, when you hit the bell, it can produce two different musical tones and um, normally, it's the center of the bell, it's a primary tone, and then to the left or the right corners is the secondary pitch, which is normally a major or a minor third higher, for those of you who know uh, music theory, which is about four or five notes away on a piano. Now, Biazong were part of um, a larger Chinese bell umbrella uh, name of zongs, which are defined by their... the um, the leaf-shaped cross-section, which is when the uh, 
the concave mouth open, open at the rim um, expands slightly from top to bottom. And again, these belts were very ceremonial. There are a lot of rituals done with them, and especially in the life of the aristocracy. And they are, that's why they are buried with the nobles, the Chinese nobles, oftentimes. So that way they can keep doing the ceremonies in the afterlife. Now, these bells, which we can't look at very closely in Google Arts and Culture, but if you go to the collection website, you'll be able to get a closer view on them. Um, they're cast on each side of a central field, so central field here in the middle. Um, and they're, so they're flanked by three ro rows of coiled bosses alternating with one row of elongated dragons. The lower field is cast with a pair of dragons. So down here, which again, you can't really see on the selections like that, you can see it. Um, and the top loop handles are attached to the body by dragon-headed terminals. Two of the bells carry a partially deciphered inscription, which makes him historically important for uh, people who study these types of bells. And based on the characters that are legible in one of the inscriptions, they're dated to the period, again, um, of the Chu Kingdom, which included most of the present-day provinces of Hubei and Hunan, which again is part of the overall um, Eastern Zhao period that I mentioned earlier. So we're just going to take a look at this gallery overall really quickly. You can see that they are kind of maintaining um, the visual impact of the bells by adding in the long vertical black panels. Uh, again, it's just evocative when you look straight down with the sight line. You have as well the iPad stand with the black um, details as well. We have lots of scrolls being hung up which are again are very light sensitive they have to be rotated out about every six months generally speaking and they also have a lot of internally lit cases which you see right here all these little tiny objects are lit internally in this case and we as well as having you know traditional japanese folding screen and a lot of other objects and you can see here how the light levels on this hanging scroll are a lot darker than the objects next to it. This is, uh, you know, the blandest uh, African art gallery that I've ever seen, which is why I like kind of showing it to everyone because truly it's just naturals on naturals and it is incredibly bland. I am very surprised based on what we'll see in the other parts of the museum that they left it this bland. I always just like showing this because um, it kind of shows how museums aren't always on top of their stuff, where they're like, oh yeah, I'm just going to let Google Arts and Culture look into this unfinished gallery that's currently being reinstalled. It's fine. So clearly no one told them that they were coming and that maybe they should uh, put up a temporary wall so this is not documented forever on the internet. But there they are. And you can see that as we move into... Um, other galleries, you know, the, the European gallery, that they're starting to add in uh, more molding on the ceiling and the fancier doorways, which is a bit more traditional for this artwork. And we're actually going to go back. I forgot that we we're going to go forward and also look at they have a uh, built in finished room down here, which we're not going to go look at too quickly, but or too closely, uh, but they do have um, built environments as well that people can step into. So this is just a uh, big, happy rainbow painting that's really, really long that I like showing people. Um, again, we're moving between the buildings here. Uh, so we saw the escalators on the left, and again, each building is basically a different topic. Um, so it's clearly like a queuing area and a movement area more than an actual exhibition area, but I, I just like showing off that rainbow. So here we're getting more into the archaeology 
area. You can see that with being built into the hill, they're kind of doing this double layer height here. You know, they're kind of utilizing their entire space also by putting mosaics above the staircases. A lot of these objects aren't light sensitive because they're stone, mosaics, tile, which is why they can have the windows open um, or not shaded is what I mean. Not, they're not literally open like airflow. And what's probably going, there's probably still UV film and to help filter out some of the light that could be damaging to the artwork. But compare this to, you know, the Chinese gallery we saw before where there's no windows in sight anywhere. And again, it's just lots of older objects, rebuilding little uh, temples, mosaics, and such like that. This is when Google Arts and Culture starts arguing with me because it is has a lot of windows open here. So if we are in, that, in a niche underneath the, um, the level I showed you earlier, because I wanted to show you this stained glass. Now, those of you who know me know that I have a deep love of stained glass. I have, teach a class also on the stained glass at Chartres Cathedral, and I will find excuses to talk about stained glass on many occasions. Now, this particular piece that we're looking at right here is reconstructed, um, it's a reconstructed window from Hisham's palace in Kirbat al-Bajar. And they are black painted glass with plaster in them. And they're early Islamic, it was an early Islamic archeological site of the Umayyad dynasty from the first half of the eighth century. So this is very, very old glass, basically my point. Um, the building is traditionally considered to have been constructed by Walid II, who ruled from 743 to 744. But in 2012, the Mets, um, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts, Jane Morgan Whitney Fellow in the Department of Islamic Art, her name was uh, Betsy Williams, kind of contested that. So uh, she thinks that it was built a bit uh, at a different time period. Now, the site is five kilometers north of Jericho, which is um, a desert uh, kusur, which is a fortified palace complex, which spread over 150 acres it's made of a palace, a bath complex, and an agricultural estate. Now, most pieces from the site, the stained glass pieces from the site, um, Tashan's palace, uh, Kirbat al -Mafjar, um, are actually at the Rockefeller Museum, but they do have these pieces here. So uh, this is a quote from um, Betsy Williams speaking about it uh, from the Met Museums website, which is uh, Kirbat al Mafjar's decorations neatly summarizes the cross-cultural currents of Umayyad elite patronage. It displays at once a visual language familiar to the Byzantine relic in its mosaic floor and from the Sasanian one in its decoration in the stucco technique practiced in those lands. Scholars have posited a connection with Egypt as well, since the building unit employed here suggests the involvement of workmen familiar with the measurements used in Coptic constructions. The specialization necessary to achieve the site's architecture and its decorations suggests the movement of craftspeople to specific sites and construction on command. So that's really important because it's showing that people are coming here specifically to make this artwork from, again, from like Byzantium, which isn't as far as, you know, London was from it, but it's still a significant amount of travel. And in May 2017, a lot of the glass uh, from the site was were analyzed, and they've been found that it has both Egyptian and Levantine manufacturer styles. Um, and this is coming from a paper uh, by uh, Fiorentini, uh, Chini, Sorelli, um, and more, and it's considering the effects of the Byzantine Islamic tra uh, transition, Umayyad glass um, tesserae and vessels from the Khazar of Kirbet al Mafjar. Um, and basically, what it's showing is that there's um, been glass coming in from both areas rather than just glass from Byzantium. So, again, also Egyptian and Levantine. And then 
in 2020, so this is fairly recent uh, analyzation by uh, Adlington, uh, Ritter, and Shabil, uh, which is a, a article they wrote called Production and Provenance of Architectural Glass from the Umayyad Period, is that there are, they've proven that as well as a few older reused tesserae and Mesopotamian plant ash glass have been um, used for amber-colored window fragments, these findings have significant implications for the production model of strongly colored glass and exploitation of resources during the early Islamic period. So what that means is that there's the use of spolia. And for those of you who don't know what spolia is, it is the reuse of older art, older, uh, you know, a lot of times, especially with like, you see it with statuary or buildings, in a new piece of artwork, which is a way of saying, look how cool we are, we're just as cool as the creators, because normally it's people of the past that the original, that the creators found held in regard. It's like, we're saying, we're just as good as them, we're just as artistic as them, we're just as creative as them, and just as talented, as smart. And so this little tiny stained glass window, which didn't look like much to begin with, other than some broken pieces of glass, has a whole lot of history where, you know, originally in, you know, just in like the last five years, we, we figured out that like, you know, there's Egyptian and Levantine manufacture that they're using Mesopotamian plant ash glass, which I'm really interested to see what else comes from studying this, because again, it's been less than a year. It's from the time I'm recording this, that um, the most recent article about it has come out. So there's a whole lot of me geeking out about stained glass. Um, I recommend that, you know, always take a second closer look at the artwork. You never really know what you're going to find out about it. And, oh, come on, Google Architecture. And so here we are back out of the uh, niche, which you could see on the left there before I moved. We're right, going to take a look now at oop, this mosaic piece, which this was originally a church aisle mosaic. It was found in Kusufim in western Negev, which is the southwestern part of the Gaza Strip. So it's desert, semi-desert sort of area, and it was made in 578 CE-ish. Um, it's about 800 centimeters tall and 260 centimeters wide. And mosaic floors were among the most popular forms of artistic expression in churches of the um, Byzantine period. However, since they were designed to be walked on, they were not decorated with sacred figures and motifs. Instead, they usually bore scenes of daily life that were common in the Hellenistic Roman artistic tradition. This mosaic shows animals hunting and being hunted, as well as imaginary beasts. The Greek inscription is the Deeds of Alexander, accompanies the image of a hunter mounted on a horse who probably represents Alexander the Great. And this is from the Israel Museum's publication um, back in 2005. So the thing that really shows it as Byzantine style is how stylized it is and how two-dimensional it is. So everyone's kind of shown without any depth. You know, they're a little, you can kind of see, argue there's a little bit of shadow here with the ripples in the fabric, but it's all pretty flat and we have some uh, more traditional side motifs, uh, border motifs that we see here. So here I just want to show you uh, some things that the museum does and to show ties between different pieces of artwork where they're just, they're, they're borrowing this piece by El Greco and they're tying it back to what's on the pedestal here by very simply using the same color, which is a very good visual way of showing ties between artwork. And again, built to into a hill means lots of staircases all throughout the museum. Here we're getting into the Jewish um, life wing, and this jewel box wall is just all different sorts of menorahs with different styles, different centuries, and the way that they've lit them, and, or displayed them and lit them, really makes them shine, like lit with literally with the uh, internal case lighting, and 
you can see that they're from all over the world, where um, Tanzania, Algeria, Italy, and you know we have large ones. And this gallery space is really just showing the uh, part of the life cycle or the year cycle. Um, this is a gallery that well, we're going to take a look at again later in a special exhibition where they have um, a lot of their light sensitive objects. They, can, they still have a little bit of light coming in through the windows, but they can block it off with these side walls. And uh, it allows people to circum circumambulate through the uh, space fairly well. Um, just the different manuscripts you can kind of zoom in on and see some. Uh, it's always done thematically. Again, that's just right across from where the menorahs were. And here we have articles of clothing as well as other important pieces. And what I really like about this from the design standpoint is, you know, we have the it's very fo focal with what they want you to look at, what they want you to focus on by putting things in the center of the room, having them encircled. And what I also like and what lots of would like is the fact that you can look at objects from both sides, which when you're trying to figure out how to construct something or how something's put together, that is always helpful to be able to look at it from all directions, you know? It's a perpetual issue that people have in museums. They're like, how do I look at that? And this is actually a window film of the Second Temple of Jerusalem, Jerusalem model that we'll take a look at um, in a moment. And behind us, again, are a lot of the archaeology pieces that aren't light sensitive. So you don't have to worry about them too much with the daylight. That a really fancy capital of a column there. And Finish turning around. Yeah, so here again is the uh, Taika Temple model. Uh, so, what you may or may not realize is that I have switched from Google Arts and Culture over to um, Google Street View. Sometimes Google Street View allows you to get a better view at something than Google Arts and Culture does. It just depends on who captures it when, things of that nature. Um, I'm not claiming to be an expert, it's just something that I've picked up on. So as I mentioned, uh, the Second Temple Jerusalem model recreates the city as of 66 CE at the height of its glory, right before the Jews revolted against the Romans. And originally this was created by Professor Abi Yona, which was um, a leading scholar specializing in ancient Jerusalem. And he did this based on um, descriptions from Jewish sources, uh, particularly the uh, Mishnah and the writings of the contemporary historian uh, Flavius Josephus. And then he also, you know, used archaeological finds from Jerusalem and other Roman cities. And it's greatly influenced by Greco-Roman culture. It reflects, there's a reflection in the style of the buildings, which, you know, we can't zoom too far in on. And the layout of the streets, where there's a holy precinct, which, you know, is at the top of the hill. And in the center, um, there, and also, oh, sorry, there was also, um, just off my place in my notes, um, but the public water facilities and there's other uh, dedicated monumental buildings like the sports and entertainment facilities. Um, at the center of the city is the Temple Mount. So there's only a single temple to a single god, which is, you know, separate from what the way the Greek Greco-Roman tradition is, and there's no sculptures in the city um, or reliefs depicting human figures or animals, which is in accordance with the second of the Ten Commandments, um, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Now, this was dedicated in 1966 in the Holy Land Hotel grounds in Jerusalem's Bayad uh, Vigan neighborhood, which 
Hans Grouch was a hotel owner, had commissioned it um, in memory of his son Jacob, who fell in the War of Independence in the battle over uh, Kibbutz Etzanim, which is where he lived. And so uh, the father, Hans Grouch, wanted to endow Jerusalem, which was then cut off from the old city with a cultural and tourist attack tourist attraction that was to show the city as it had looked at this peak before the destruction. Um, again, the the, museum, the model had to be moved in 2006, so it's thought into 100 parts, and the Israel Museum was deemed to be the most appropriate site. So that's how it came to be here. And this, combined with the shrine of the book, represents the full spectrum of the various groups and currents that compromised Jewish society at the end of the Second Temple period. The model reflects the social, economic, and political elite, while the story of the separatist groups who re rejected a life of luxury and corruption but then characterized the city and its temple is told in the shrine of the book. Their literature and spiritual world are reflected in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are on display in the shrine of the book. So again, that's coming from the museum website, and we're going to, you can, whoop, gonna walk. you can kind of see it's right in the middle of everything here. And we're going to go take a look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is, as I mentioned, there's a very big tunnel, which is whoop, right off modern, straight into evocative tunnel, which also helps give your eyes time to adjust to the darkness that the Dead Sea Scrolls have to be kept in and helps acquaint you with some of the history of them if you're not well aware. So here we are. Um, now, the Dead Sea Scrolls do have to be changed out every three to six months to protect them. But we're right inside that little white cap I showed you earlier, which is where you're seeing all the ridges from. It's very low light levels due to the uh, how delicate the objects are. And in this close-up, you can see how they've transcribed what's below. And this is actually a really ingenious thing that they did here. What they did is, so they don't have to move this very delicate, very, very, very old object very frequently. They are just covering up sections of it. So that way they don't have to go, oh, let's totally pull it in and take it out. Every single time that we need to do a little bit of protection on it, we can just add a new transcription spot, take off the last piece, or take off a section. And again, that's what's happening every three to six months here. And again, they do have an extensive garden, which have a lot of artwork. You can look out over the city, as well as the artwork that we saw throughout the rest of the museum grounds. This is a very, you have taken this early in the morning before visitors were there. So the um, website does have virtual tours. It takes you first to the Google Arts and Culture, which is what we were just looking at. But it also has the separately um, loaded tours, which we're going to go ahead and take a peek at. So we're going to the Faces of Power, which is Ro Roman gold coins from the Victor, Victor Atta collection. And uh, not sure why it's not letting me open that. Sorry about that. That's all of that. It would not let me open. Here we go. So we're taking a look. And um, the emojis, uh, the legacy and scripts. So this was actually captured not by uh, Google Arts and Culture, but rather by Matterport. Matterport is a separate uh, exhibition space collection, uh, 3D render, not 3D rendering, but 3D uh, visual collection uh, interface similar to Google Arts and Culture. Um, I actually like it better than Google Arts and Culture, but it's not as extensively known or used by museums. So it has different colored uh, dots. You know, this will take us into the blue, takes you into the next phase. The purple is information on the text. 
which is information that's on the wall. And as you can see, that's way better than Google Arts and Culture, where you'll be zooming in, you know, scrolling in, trying to get a good view. And some museums actually have, uh, you know, links to their uh, YouTube about what you can see or hear. You can also, um, you know, it starts talking to you about what they're doing. And so that's links to YouTube of what the video was. But yeah, here it lets you go through. You can also zoom in. You can also zoom out and you can learn more about the objects. And so that's part of why I like Matterport better than Google Arts and culture. It's a, it's a little bit easier to handle and it's higher quality images in a lot of cases. So thank you everyone for joining me. Um, I hope you enjoyed this virtual museum visit of the Israel Museum Jerusalem and feel free to take a look on my YouTube page or the Pensac University page as well as the Palacio de Iberia uh, 2 page for some of the other classes that I have taught. Thank you.